All right, so we have the CTO of Bitfinex, Paolo, on to talk with us. Um, and uh, we've had Bitfinex on a number of times, so we don't have to go through all the background stuff. But thanks for taking the time out of your busy schedule, Paolo, to come on here and talk with us. It is my pleasure. Thank you for having me. Great. Um, so let's start because I, I noticed uh, that uh, you guys are funding Lightning Network uh, developers, and you also are one of the few exchanges that support liquid sidechain deposits, both for LBTC and uh, uh, also for liquid Tether and also Lightning deposits and withdrawals. Is that true? Yes, that is correct. I think that's really cool because not many exchanges are making that effort. And especially you go above and beyond by actually funding the Lightning Network developers. Can you tell us a bit about your experience in uh, integrating both Liquid and Lightning and how you came about uh, funding and supporting development uh, within Lightning itself? All right. Yes. So let's start with Liquid. So. Um... I think that Liquid is a really good product. The integration cost was not really uh, much, I would say, compared to integrating uh, just normal Bitcoin node. Um, the APIs works pretty much similar to Bitcoin node. You just need to add um, another parameter that is the asset ID that represents, of course, Bitcoin or any other issued asset like um, Tether, for example. So on the integration side, uh, Liquid has been really easy. The issuance of Tether on Liquid as well has been um, nice and easy as well. Uh, so you have uh, you can create uh, assets um, via multisig. So it's pretty cool. Um, you the assets are confidential. So one of the things that I like is the fact that let's say that someone wants to move uh, twenty million dollars to an exchange uh, to to buy Bitcoin. You don't have Whale Alert and or any other tool. Um, um, announce it to everyone because no one can see it, right? So, in in theory, in my opinion, this is a better way to protect traders that want to to start, um, let's say, building positions and uh, you know whales that uh, that are interested to you know um, either sell, uh, yeah, buy and 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 um, uh, buy a bunch of, of Bitcoin. So is um that is the thing that i like um and uh it it's pretty seamless we are also running um the functionary that is the the box uh that has been provided by blockstream um is on you know is also cool that that uh, that we can play around with the hardware that that contain any HS, hsm so um so we are going through many iterations to to improve the network and make sure that the network is stable uh, we have periodic, um, I mean, also in the board, in the technical board. So um, part of my role is also trying to help and advise um, how uh, Liquid can be used by exchanges and be integrated faster by exchanges. Uh, on the Tether side, as I said, the, the issuance was was fairly uh, fairly easy and also managing, um, you know, additional issuances or burns um, is, is fairly easy. So um, I believe that um liquid is um is a good uh tool for uh, uh for enterprises and for let's say more professional settlements um and also it is kind of already battle tested um at the same time we have um we started working hard on uh, lightning network um lightning network for me is really has um a micropayment system should be designed and built because it's super resilient. I really love the fact that it can resist to an apocalypse in theory. You have the, this all, um, so you can create your own group, your own set of nodes. You can connect directly to friends. You can connect, you can create this sort of really resilient small networks across your friends. And then you have uh, some of your friends can connect, be connected to bigger hubs and bigger hubs can be connected to other hubs to and to, at other and those apps can be connected to local uh, other local groups right so it's really a, a sort of grape uh, if you imagine like a fruit and this and is uh, each grape is separate but it can is interlinked by by hubs or or bigger nodes for example so 
the entire things uh, about um, uh, onion routing uh, that is enabling Lightning Network allows really, um, uh, what excites me is that the onion routing allows, for example, to create chats or build uh, social networks and many, many things on top of uh, Lightning Network possibly. So, um, in my opinion, uh, Lightning Network, uh, well, not only my opinion, but basically Lightning Network was kind of missing the ability of issuing digital assets. So um, there was a group already formed. So I am not, um, I'm, I don't really want to take any um, praise for this but because there was a project called RGB that was initiated by Giacomo Zucco and uh, Peter Todd. Um, um, for for a while was um, was not super active and in um, we met in Malta with also John Carvalho and um, and, and others and um, and Giacomo and we um, figure out that we should try to resume the project and fund the project in order to to bring it to completion because having uh, a stable coin and uh, additional digital assets on Lightning Network yeah, in my opinion is a really killer application because you can really build a true decentralized economy and a really resilient economy. You can issue tokens, you can issue, um, let's say, gift cards, whatever you want on, on, on top of Lightning Network. So that is why we decided to fund, um, to fund the project alongside a few other uh, um, uh, um, entities that are uh, contributing. Uh, the, the current progress is good. Um, so uh, it is a, still a command line level, but the protocol is already um, spec'd out and has been already reviewed by uh, in um, its uh, uh, primary form by, by Peter Todd and uh, by Alecos uh, Flini, that uh, is um, another developer that is working on RGB as, as, uh, alongside with, uh, with Maxime, that is the leader of the project in, in this moment. So is the RGB project the one that you're focusing most of the resources on, or is there other areas of Lightning that you, are, you guys are funding? So um, we are um, funding mainly uh, RGB in this moment, um, but we are looking to fund other projects um, because we want to make sure that, especially wallets, we want to make sure that the moment uh, RGB is ready, uh, it can be implemented, integrated in, in uh, Lightning Network enabled uh, wallets quite easily. So having, um, and, um, funding wallets and collaborating with them will give give us that edge and understanding what they need so um, this is the other thing that we are looking uh in this period cool so so what do you think uh, regarding liquid uh, just to rewind back to that what do you think has uh, made adoption pretty slow on liquid what do you think they need to do to get people more interested to use um you know the confidential transactions and the different issued assets on liquid um because uh, I had a feeling that maybe it was related to being difficult to integrate, but it sounds like you guys didn't have much difficulty doing it. So what's taking exchanges so long to integrate it and to get people to actually use it? Well, I believe that is just a matter of necessity, right? In uh, in end of 2017, you had all those crazy um, Bitcoin fees that were costing transfer on Omni uh, up to $500 per trans transfer, right? So uh, then we decided to add another chain that was Ethereum to, to Tether, for example. So, and, um, but then suddenly the fees, uh, the on-chain on the on fees went down. So no one really cared about the um, uh, Tether Ethereum integration until then um, beginning of 2019, really. So the, uh, I'm saying this because this, that is the same uh, issue that I'm feeling is happening with uh, with Liquid. I believe that as soon as there will be um, a spike in, in uh, transaction fees and there will be a need for a faster settlement and uh, in um, faster but still big, big settlements, then uh, more and more changes will start adopting Liquid because Lightning Network is still, I mean, you, you really don't want to exceed 0 0.5 BTC per transaction or well, well per channel size, right? So um, then with uh, Lightning, uh, sorry, Liquid will, it will fix that and uh, it allows even 1,000, 2,000 BTC transfers. But uh, there is, in this moment, I believe that exchanges don't see the need to add Liquid to their, to their offering. And as a federation member, 
do you find the cost structure and everything to still be economical to contribute on that level or is it maybe prohibitive on some way for some members to continue uh that's a good question so um um, the cost of operation for us is uh, negligible. So um, I think that also we are in really early stages of, of liquid. Um, so um, it's hard for me to answer the, the question uh, at this moment. I believe that with more adoption, it will be uh, it will become more and more uh, sustainable anyway in long term. And I really believe that if the, in in the next uh, let's say in the next possible bull run. Uh, more and more exchange will start using it so we will see ramping up the number of uh, btc available and also the number of other <clears throat> uh, tokens issued on, on on top of liquid yeah and i think most exchanges are already running a full node on bitcoin so it's not that difficult to run a liquid core on top of that for their own transactional purposes but i think the blockstream needs to step it up a bit when it comes to the wallet support i think Right now, they only have the mobile wallet in addition to the uh, Liquid Core client. And the QT desktop is still in beta, last I checked. Um, so I think help that helps also just with everyday use. Because I, I agree more or less with what you're saying about it being a uh, more business case, maybe like high, more sophisticated users. But it's also pretty user friendly. It can be pretty user friendly, at least for people just doing smaller payments back and forth. So um if there was more wallets and availability in that sense it would probably be easier to to boost adoption yeah i definitely agree um i think that um an electrum um version of liquid would be cool as well that is um one of the wallets people are more familiar with um and um yeah so mm, i think that the ux is has been really uh one of the major blockers of the entire industry anyway and I th think that that applies also to to Liquid in this moment. Definitely. So uh, let's let's talk about some of the more recent updates you guys have uh, made on the change at the Phoenix. So um, can you tell us what this Berserker mode uh, feature is that you recently added? Yes. So um, the idea is really simple. Um, is really works better if you are playing with a mobile application, if you are trading with a, with a mobile application. So you can set the order book mode and you can set an order size like um, 0.1 BTC. And then you click on the um, ask side or on the bid side and it will place limit orders at the level you clicked, but on the opposite direction, right? So if you click on the ask side, you will place a limit by order at the ask um, uh, level that, that you clicked on. Um, same on the, the, the bit, if you click on the bit side, it will sell at that level. So is a, is a cool way to really, um, uh, trying to, um, move faster in, uh, in certain situation where you maybe are trying to scalp directly with, uh, you know, with, um, uh, directly without any software help. So we decided to do it, um, to, to offer it both on the, on the main, uh, web app. Uh, and in the mobile application. Paolo, where did the inspiration come from for this Berserker mode? Sorry, can you ask it again? I said, where did the inspiration come from for this Berserker mode? So, um, really, there was, um, you know, we we are uh, we hired recently um, a business development team that is helping us that that first of all has experience in uh, um, in traditional markets in oil markets and uh, uh, commodities and so on right and so we, we 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 met in london we started discussing about what they were used to use in uh, in um, their uh, previous experience and uh, that order book mode or berserk mode it was one of the features that uh, most of them asked to us. So, uh, and it was really, really easy to add. So there was no reason for me to not add it. Yeah, and I could see how a screen trader could benefit from this. Um, <clears throat> another another one of the features you recently released was um, Bitfinex Pulse, which um, from what I can gather just by playing with it a bit, it's like a... KYC required version of Twitter within the Bitfinex platform. Could you tell us a bit about 
what the motivation for this bit Phoenix policy is and if there's more to it coming or what the deal is with it? Sure. Um, I understand how, from an initial point of view, it can seem like can it can seem a KYC version of Twitter. Uh, it's really not like that. Uh, as you might understand, you don't want to allow from day one everyone to start um, swearing in your platform without proper controls, right? So. Um, we decided to, first of all, add, uh, allow only um, verified users to be able to, um, to, to create public policies. At the same time, you can, if you are a news outlet or you are a data provider, you can still contact us and we can whitelist you anyway. The, um, and this is the, the, the reason for that, again, is to ensure that the noise is reduced until we add additional features. Of course, in the version two that will come with, within one month, we'll have the follow, follow uh, trader uh, functionality. So you can start following and deciding whom you want to, uh, to see in your feed. So that will reduce the noise and we can gradually open to more and more users. So the current situation is temporary. So it does sound like Twitter. Because you can't even follow people. You're forced to just see the entire feeds of everybody and when you say follow you don't mean like copy trading where some guy goes long and you're able to then follow that trade and uh, stuff like that you're talking about literally just like twitter follow in order to follow what someone's tweeting or posting or whatever you call it about on, on the bitfinex platform yes and yes but that is only for the beginning so we are we are planning more um more um uh, complex copy trading features. So the next version will see the ability of uh, Twitter following, Twitter-like following, and the ability of um, sharing um, your portfolio composition on in percentages and your uh, um, including also the margin positions that you have, uh, similarly to what we do in a um, smaller to a smaller extent in the leaderboard. Um, as you have might have seen, we also have the integration of pools with the leaderboard. Also, you will have the ability of, um, um, you know, of um, connecting external data feeds into your private pools, so you can hook all the news providers that you want directly in your screen. Uh, there are probably hundreds of ideas that we are working on, uh, and we are prioritizing them. For example, as you know, we have uh, the OTC desk. So one uh, of the uh, next features that we are going to add to pools is the ability of uh, um, the OTC desk to, pu to publish um, OTC deals as pulses, and as, as well as um, normal users, Bitfinex users that create an OTC deal that uh, is available to everyone, so they don't select a destination or a target nickname, that, that they can decide also to publish their um, their um, OTC deal on pools. So if you follow the OTC pools user, then you will be able to see all the pools in real, all the OTC deals in real time, and you can decide to participate in them um, uh, quickly. So um, there are plenty of improvements and things that we want to add. Of course, you have to start from um, you know a basic implementation, and with time, we will increase uh, uh, gigantically the number of features that will be available. Yeah. So so basically, the thing you're talking about with the um, OTC deals is that you'll use pools as a way to facilitate the RFQ process between people trading OTC. So people that are requesting quotes and responding to them, you can actually handle the deal making within pools. That's correct. You know, uh, one of the things that always um, really interested me um, in my previous career was that everyone was paying uh, 15, 20 grand per year for, for Bloomberg, right? One of the main reasons, when, when I was asking why the hell, uh, everyone was saying, okay, the reason is that it has, for, for the chat mainly, because in the chat you have really easy ways to participate to um, either OTC deals or to, to um, for, um, you know, to, to interact with other traders. And, but the cool thing is that you have really integrated tools directly in the chat uh, to to perform certain actions. 
So we are trying to bring that um, a similar uh, experience, not um, not same, but not maybe not even similar. But the concept is we want to, to have to, to have pools becoming uh, the backbone of the communication among uh, inter uh, traders in Bitfinex. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, so another feature that you added a little bit further back was Honey framework for algo traders. Um, how many people actually use this? Uh, do you have any data on this? So uh, we have currently, uh, I would say, less than 100 users uh, that are actively using it. Uh, one of the main issues that we had was that uh, most of the users that we got that were interested in uh, Honey Framework were on Mac. And uh, they, they had a problem installing Honey Framework in the latest version of uh, OS X. That was that is being fixed uh, already in version 3.05. Um, right now we are 3.1. And um, also one other thing that we are uh, thinking just to make a connection between Honey Framework and and Bitfinex pools is the ability of traders also to create and share uh, strategies and um, as as code that they build on Honey Framework directly with pools, right? And so, and the ability of backtesting those. Um, so you can you can follow, you can share your strategies and the, the, the let's say the pools backend will backtest those strategies and the result will be, uh, let's say, accruing directly in pools as, um, as a continuous result, let's say. Yeah, I think the goofy part about Honey Framework is actually that you have to download it separately and build it and run it. And it's not just built, it's not just a, a part of the platform, you know, it's not just a section on the website where you can manage the code, save strategies, uh, stuff like that. Um, because uh, recently FTX, which has been absolutely killing it on uh, product and all kinds of other stuff, they, um, they released something called Quant Zone, which you can actually code in the different strategies and logic and they save it on their site and everything's just triggered uh, through the site and this i think is um it's just easier for people it's it's more it's universally accessible you don't have to worry about uh, oh are they able to build it on this os versus that um and i think that's probably the barrier when it comes to this honey framework stuff so i i see your point and uh, honestly has been a big um a, a theme of big discussion internally so what I really don't like. So I started developing um, in back in end to the, well, it was I think that was end of 2017, uh, something like that for Bitfinex, and I decided that was not the right uh, path because from a user perspective, you don't have any idea of the priorities on in which your order will be executed if relies on um, if basically is executed on a virtual machine on uh, the exchange server, right? It's really hard to understand how optimized is that, how will um, react to, to changes, to market changes. So I really believe that if you want to have, to, to have the highest performances and ensure that your strategy that you are building with the Honey Framework get, um, will have the highest return you want to ensure that you can rent a server real nearby um our, the matching engine and you can strip down all the logic that you don't need and you can execute that um through a really simple stack so the so what we do, the reason why we we decided to go with the honey framework in this solution is really to to give more transparency on how we build things and how they get executed. And basically they are get executed with the same WebSocket APIs that we offer for normal API, API traders. So I, I really didn't like the idea of, um, of creating a black box where user for sure can input parameters, but how do that, that thing will work in a really stressful situation when the platform will, let's say, how how that will work during the 12 or 13 of March? That is my question mark. Uh, so I didn't want to to get the blame from users saying, well, but you prioritize an order instead of uh, another user order instead of mine. So I wanted to keep the entire stack really simple and using exactly what we offer to the uh, to the all the high frequency traders but just something that you can install on, on your machine and run it and potentially change it because it's open source.
Hmm. I, I think there, there should have been a compromise because if you look at trading view, which you can code indicators on and code strategies on, you know, people everywhere, you know, left and right are coding strategies, back testing, you know, on trading view because they don't have to do anything. They just have to code the strategy and they let it run. And yeah, what you say, okay, who's getting the order of the priority if you just do it on the Phoenix site itself? Fine. But, um, you know, it's because it's so easy for them to just do it there that, you know, anybody can do it. So by having to, by forcing them to have to download something and run something, you know, you're taking potential people that can be involved in this from 100 down to two. Whereas if you have it online, you're going from 100 to 90. And if people want to copy and paste the strategy from the online thing and run it into the into their own black box and, you know, let them do that as well. But um... so we are working on a web uh, simplified web version with no uh, what whatsoever, no guarantees, because, again, uh, it's really hard to guarantee Everything is fine until you get to twelve. The, uh, until you get to the twelfth and thirteenth of March, so I really want to see such solutions uh, working really. Um, um, you know, we, uh, reacting in one millisecond uh, for all the users that are using that that solution online solution. Um, uh, so I, I really want to see how that works. So that is, that is why we decided to create a framework that we can eventually instantiate on on basically a swarm of, uh, of web servers, but you have first to code a really slick core. You have to first build a set of you know, tools to, to, to be able to do that. You can, if you do that open source, people can see exactly what you are doing and fine. I mean, um, I, I believe that... Um, well, look, well, look, think about it like this. For, for, for everything you've just said, uh, it's probably cost effective to literally rent a VPS box per user that presses run strategy, rent a VPS box, get somebody from Phoenix to SSH in, set up Honey Framework and press play for them, literally for the money they'll generate from fees. Because you know, if you have a hundred people that want to do it and only two can do it, you're only getting two users worth of fees. If you've got 100 users and 90 can press play and run, then you know, you're know going to get a lot more fees. You're going to get more volume, going to get more liquidity, more action. Look, I see your point. Um, and again, we are working on that. So we, but we wanted to start from the open source and downloadable version. Also because, um, and uh, uh, you know, I don't want to sound rude, but the, the entire idea is that uh, we are we are here because of Bitcoin, right? Where you are in, in theory, you are supposed to run your own node. So I would expect that people really care about that aspect eventually. And of course, then we are going to offer, let's say, the SPV version of Honey Framework, where you are uh, you have maybe just a website, and in the behind the scenes, you have your um, your um, basically a, a backend that is hosted by the Bitfinex platform. Fine, but. You know, his party is also trying to fit in, in in this industry. You don't even have to make it that complicated, even if the, because a lot of people run the, the code strategies on TradingView, and then they use a Chrome extension to then uh, ping them through to, you know, a server, which then fires them through to Phoenix itself or whatever. You know, even if you just had it where the strategy runs in the browser, and then it just use their existing connection and web socket. And if they shut the window, you know, boom, the strategy just stops. Even something like that as well. You know, making it easier for as many people as possible to engage with, participate with, and just say, look, here's a template. Here's an EMA cross strategy. There you go. Sure. I mean, we are working on that. But, uh, you know, you have to start somewhere. And for me, having... Um, and we creating the stack that we would use then on the hosted version was the right path so that everyone can run it and everyone can take care of their own machine if they want. If they want to buy a machine that is 10 meters from our machine engine, fine, let's let them do it. Because anyway, the majority of the fees paid on exchange are made by people that are able to do this, right? So um, we wanted, so that is 95% of the revenues of an exchange. 
people that are able to deploy that strategy. So we wanted to create tools for them, and then the same tools can be adapted for everyone. That's the beauty of it. Instead, if you start from the opposite direction, you are not able to do, you cannot deliver a product that you are hosting online. And it's really unlikely that we will offer open source at some point. I, I agree that you, you know, you've got to start making the direction there, but we are quite a long way since Tony Framework started and you know adoption is still zero on it but as for users who generate revenue you know this is a kind of fat tail long tail thing you know uh, my friend did a website and he chased long tails so he had a hundred thousand visits a day from a hundred thousand keywords i had a hundred thousand visits a day from two keywords i got nuked on the one keyword boom i just lost half my traffic so yeah you can have two or three big customers but if they get pissed off then you know you're pretty hurt if you've got two or two or three hundred thousand customers who are contributing tiny little bits you've got a much more resilient uh, customer base yes that is why we are basically we created between Pulse and we are uh, working on on uh, any framework we are working on lightning network we are working on uh, tens of other things because we are working on wallets, on uh, non-custodial wallets and all these things integrated with Bitfinex. We are working on Dazar, uh, we are working on really tens of projects also to, to reach that goal. Uh, unfortunately, the reality is that uh, you have to, um, and you know, I, I'm not saying that uh, I don't have a preference, I'm just saying that um, you have to build a stack that is performant in a way that even the most experienced trader will will be comfortable in using it, and then you have to adapt it to people to to for everyone. You cannot start in the from the opposite direction, in my opinion. Yeah, I mean, I think from my perspective, I I kind of am on the similar side of uh, Flipper, where I think it's admirable that you are taking more of like a crypto and sovereign stance when it comes to people, you know, running their own um, sort of algo. Uh, box and uh, being in command of everything on in that regard but i think sometimes when it comes to these cool ideas especially from an engineering perspective it's good to have like a filter on it to see whether it makes sense as a, from a product perspective like whether it's uh, marketable and whether it's going to appeal to a broader uh, user base and something that is within the platform there are trade-offs as we've already discussed but this, I think, has a bit more of a broader appeal. But let's uh, close this uh, particular topic and uh, let's talk about uh, Leo, uh, which a lot of uh, a lot of us here uh, have been involved in. And uh, I don't know if you saw, but uh, on Whalepool we uh, coded a little estimate to check whether or not the Leo burns were proportional to the volume, at least on Bitcoin dollar. And we found a pretty high correlation, which was, you know. Uh, which was reassuring to us um and um and so could you could you maybe just for some background tell us uh timeline wise maybe you could walk through this loan that tether has given to phoenix and the issuance of leo and uh and why they both had to happen uh to plug this hole from crypto capital uh, money being frozen so as you might understand i can talk can cannot talk much about it so um, otherwise, uh, our legal counsel will slap me really hard in the face. Um, so uh, the reality is that uh, Leo uh, definitely um, was uh, um, uh, was done um, to in order to um, to create uh, to to offer us a way to um, um, to cover for for um, what happened with crypto capital while we where we are currently uh, dealing with a situation in different courts in different jurisdictions so um, definitely Leo was built to be transparent uh, we from day one we decided to um, have a way for users to track how much Leo were burned every minute or every five minutes uh, from a web page, so um, you can see the activity of uh, the, the Leo buying bot directly on the Leo USD market. Um, so Leo is a story of uh, transparency, is a story of 
movement of Bitcoin, uh, Bitfinex towards uh, you know full transparency, uh, really uh, showing how much money the exchange is making, uh, what we are doing um, uh, to uh, uh, bad and good times. So I, I really like that. I believe that no one, no other exchange is offering it. And um, you know, most of uh, what I didn't like with um, uh, what I usually don't like with uh, with uh, with uh, the other um, exchange tokens is that it's um, you know the the burning mechanism is not really clear. They say, okay, we made this money, or well, we decided just to burn this amount, and and that's it, right? So I, I just. Um, I, I just really, um, I just really like the way we design it uh, because that was the the, the more, most fair way for everyone to, to design it. Also, uh, we 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 don't expect um, to um, we don't expect on you know people uh, speculating in uh, with crazy price on Leo in the short term is is not fair. Uh, Leo is um, there is a really uh, good. Uh, buyback uh, and uh, burning mechanism that allow the price to be stable. And I believe that we are proving that because no one wants to have a token that does 300% and minus 200% and so on, right? We want, we want to have a token that after an initial period, it settles and grows over time. That is the entire idea that, that, around uh, an, exchange, uh, an exchange token. So we wanted to create a really fair, um, uh, economical model, and I believe that uh, among all the, the 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 other exchange tokens, we we were able to achieve that. Yeah, I think, uh, and that that's exactly the data that we used when we posted the analysis to check the correlation because you had it on such a low time frame with the buy and burns that we were able to compare pretty low time frame volume fluctuations, and the correlation was extremely high versus the reported volume on Bitcoin Dollar. Uh, which is the largest uh, pair uh, versus the buy and burn uh, uh, timing. So, it, yeah, we didn't find any issues with it. And I think that is definitely a good feature. And I do like the transparency of it. But, um, I mean, one thing that wasn't incredibly transparent was how uh, Tether had lent this money to Bitfinex uh, to, um, to, to plug the hole initially. Uh, it was revealed later, but uh, I think it's puzzling to some people why it was necessary to issue the Leo, even though this uh, Tether loan was in play. I don't know how much you can talk about this, but it's a subject of some confusion for some people why both were necessary uh, if the hole was already pluggable by the loan. Uh, hello. Uh, sorry, there must has been some issues with um, uh, uh, push to talk. So I was saying that basically I I'm not comfortable in uh, in uh, discussing this this matter because I'm really not the, the right person to address both the financial side of things and the legal side of things. You know, and I don't want to say thing. Um, you know, I don't want to to say things that might even confuse more. So. I guess that uh, what uh, what had to be said was, was said um, publicly, and um, of course, uh, nothing is uh, nice as you want, maybe. But uh, I think that uh, we did a good job in uh, then explaining to the community how things worked. Hmm. Um, I think there's still some. I, I don't want to belabor the point or anything. It's just that, like for example, talking with Alistair about it i think he had a different timeline for example than flipper had on you know what came first the loan or the leo issuance i don't know i don't know exactly how clear it is to be honest from the public statements um flipper was there something you wanted to add or um, you um no i mean what, what are your thoughts paolo on the actual buyback rate at the moment because you know current projection is like what we're we talking about 50 years for the buyback i mean so 50 years with this current, first of all, with this current volume and, um, you know, the our volume, no one will ever be able to, to blame us to manipulate the volume because you, you can see that when 
the, the, the price moved $20, we are not making much volume. And I be believe that is fine, right? You cannot make um, $500 million uh, in a day when the price moved $10. I believe that is with the current market size of, um, of the crypto industry, um, and the current liquidity, that is, uh, that is an absurd number, in my opinion. Uh, when the price moves, um, Bitfinex basically jumps, uh, as soon as there is a volatility, Bitfinex jumps two to three times uh, in volume as the competition. I believe that is the most important metric. So, uh, you know, even in 2016, everyone was uh, saying, okay, Bitfinex has lower volume than the competition, many competitors are above Bitfinex and so on, right? But then eventually in 2017, the volatility came and there is when Bitfinex shines. Um, I think that uh, uh, volatility will, uh, uh, a year of full volatility will come again uh, or even more. The, the size of the entire crypto industry will, will uh, become 10, 20, 100 times bigger. And then is where I believe that um, the burning rate will increase um, because the revenues of the exchange will, 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 will jump really high. Yeah, I think, I think that makes sense. I think a lot of us are on board with that projection that the industry is going to have another growth spurt uh, relatively soon. Uh, regarding the buyback of Leo, um, so it's a portion of the revenues which is dedicated towards Leo, which makes Leo basically an instrument that's a claim on uh, future revenues. And don't you think it would be difficult to to buy back every last Leo token if the closer you get to a small supply, the higher the price will be per token? It'll become like a really, really high priced uh, token because it represents a claim on the percentage of revenues for Bitfinex. So that, that's not even uh, profits, but it's actually revenues, right? Uh, so how does that even look mathematically? So I know you're more engineer than a finance guy, but think about it mathematically. How does it make sense? The fewer and fewer tokens there are, it, it would actually exponentially grow uh, the price per token, would it not? How do you actually buy back and burn the last few tokens, for example? How does that look? So, um... I come from a um, math background uh, applied to computer science, and honestly, uh, that was in the plan. So that was clear from from day one. We will never probably will never be able to to redeem the last Leo because the last Leo will probably uh, be priced to one billion dollars. And um, so what we decided with Leo is basically to say to devote um, that part of revenues to our uh, community. That's it. So we don't we didn't put that uh, internally a timeline to buy all back. We knew that it, uh, uh, it's it's clear that from a, a pure financial and mathematical point, point of view, you will we will never be able to buy it back. And it's fine. That will guarantee to the last um, Leo holders uh, a huge um, potential revenue. So um, for us, it's fine. So Paolo, when you when you basically sold away 30% of Finex for a billion dollars uh, right after the bubble, uh, you know, looking back on that in hindsight, do you consider that it, that it was a good deal or would you rather have changed different aspects of that deal? Well, um, I think that was a helpful deal. Um, so I think that we will see in the future. Of course, if you st we start making... One hundred million dollars per day. It was a bad deal. Yeah, yeah. So it's like at the time you didn't know it was gonna that you were gonna start making so much money so fast again, but it was necessary at the time. Is what you're saying? Um, yeah. and, how, and how do uh, shareholders feel in general? Because obviously, you know, they've been pretty shafted by this overall. Uh, what what's the general sentiment there? Well, I mean, um, we we hear some um, uh, praise from um, uh, many shareholders. Some other shareholders are uh, less happy. You know, um, it uh, it depends from the people. Also, um, uh, you know, we, we did this uh, consulting all the major shareholders. So um, it, it was uh, it it has to be done, and we did it. I mean, I, I, okay. So I, I I understand why 
uh, indirectly, some shareholders would support it because it was necessary to keep the company going and liquid and to keep the shares uh, having some worth. But there hasn't been a dividend payment in, I'm looking at my watch, like what, two years or so, maybe a little bit less or so. And, uh, and they're profitable. Um, so my, my concern is just that like this Leo token, which was issued was, is basically a higher share class uh, versus the shareholders. And there's a lot of people in Wayapool, for example, four years ago. Or so, which, uh, you know, supported the company, bought BFX tokens, converted them to equity, you know, because we believed in the, uh, exchange. And now you've got this Leo token, which has really trumped, uh, all the shareholders. Uh, and maybe it was necessary to keep the company afloat, but I think, you know, no shareholder is happy that there has been zero dividends uh, for the last couple of years. And now it's revenue, which is buying back Leo. And you admit yourself mathematically, it's like impossible, <laughs> which uh, I'm a bit confused exactly how that works then. But it basically forced everyone who wants to have an interest in Phoenix to long Leo in order to get the same exposure that they had already with the shares. So that's the concern from a lot of people here, at least, uh, regarding Leo versus shareholders. No, I completely get that. You know, I, I think that it is reasonable to be upset. So um, the, quest, the first question that comes to my mind is, uh, which other crypto exchange ever gave a, a dividend, right? We gave really big dividends for quite some time. Of course, um, um, uh, uh, certain events happened and we had to stop it. But the fact that we, in the future we will give dividends, it will be 30% dividend that is 30% that will be 30% less, right? I, I don't, I mean, I can understand why 30% is a lot and is really annoying. Uh, don't tell me about it. I'm, I'm really pissed off as well, but still um, it, it, it has to be done. So um, I think that uh, um, what we did with Leo was, um, the best outcome that we could seek at the moment. I think that it was engineered uh, really well. Um, there is no, um, there is no always a perfect choice. Um, I think that in the future, when if we uh, issue dividends, um, we will do it when our chest will be uh, quite bigger. So we learned that we have to have a bigger chest in uh, in uh, in Bitfinex, and then eventually we will uh, start offering again dividends. There will be um, uh, a thirty percent less, maybe in size, due to, to Leo. Uh, but um, Leo also helped us to get, to gain a bigger community, helped us to um, to uh, make things easier for uh, for um, the last year, this year, and so on. Um, so uh, it gave us a really big war chest, you know. Uh, so I think that uh, everything has a price. Um, and uh, believe me, we, we we didn't take the decision really uh, in a lightweight way. Why thirty percent of revenue and not profits? Uh, because we, um, you know, we are a lean operation. We have uh, less than one hundred fifty employees, probably one less than one hundred thirty, you know, and uh, we we compete and we are sure that uh, our uh, market share will be quite higher and our revenues will be quite higher than uh, any other exchange in the space when the real uh, volatility will come again. So uh, the, the, our ability of keeping the operation really simple and, and, and uh, uh, slick uh, is um, something that we, we take a lot of praise for. So we decided that uh, if, um, you know, if we were only saying 30% um, of the, um, the profit, um, that would not be as... Um, interesting for for uh, the leo buyers because in theory you can you know you can increase the company cost a lot so we wanted to show full transparency and we want to show that wanted to show that we don't have any interest in uh, increasing the company cost and we want to keep the company lean for for the time being if only there was a mechanism whereby you know another thirty percent of revenue also went into a a separate transparent pot that then got paid out in dividends. But it's funny you talk about you know transparency and lean machine. Uh, you said one hundred and forty employees. I mean, we were talking about this today when we're saying you know uh, back where pre Leo, uh, Phoenix's market dominance was much higher. Uh, liquidity was higher. 
uh, volume share was higher and you were operating on 30 employees, you know, now you're talking about five times as many employees and yet market share is down, volume oh, is yeah. down. And I, know I know there's a tendency for people to, you know, freeload and ride the boats and, and bloatware creeps in. I mean, what do you think? I think that uh, before Leo was um, March 2019, we had 95 employees. So it was not, so the 30 employees was beginning of 2000, well, end to 2017, when basically the company was really underwater with uh, uh, thousands of tickets and, and things like that, right? So every company started to, to pose registrations to, in order to, to sustain the, the big bull run, right? But we, so I think that if you had 30 as a number of people that we had the month before Leo, you have it wrong. It was 95. So we added in one year 40 people just in order to not really to increase the number of people in different teams. The, the development team did increase of uh, in net uh, um, net didn't increase. Really, we created new teams like a business development team, marketing team, um, and the public relations team had to be created. So that's why we hired more. So really. <laughs> You know, it is great that they've been created, but they haven't yielded anything more because it has not grown. It's pulled it's well, back. The, the business development team was our one month ago. The, the, you cannot um, uh, realistically say that we didn't improve our job in, uh, in PR and marketing because that is, that is what at least e either people are lying to me or that is one of the most evident things that everyone say that things change in the last six months. So you have to, to be to, you know, we are not hiring hundreds of people and, and waiting for them to deliver something. We hiring only the best people that we can find and we take a lot of time to teach them and they deliver results as the marketing team are, is doing, as the PR team is doing. And I believe the business development team that we hired will be doing in the next six months. Yeah, I, I think it's good that you finally got some PR going on Phoenix. I think that's one of the criticisms that a lot of us have had over the years that there was too much of this sort of uh, like opting out of playing the PR game for Phoenix and Taylor and uh, I think it's better to get ahead of the message and to you know form the narrative from there. So I think that makes a lot of sense. The business development expansion, I think, also makes sense. But uh, do you guys have like a product uh, center team which uh, acts as like a sort of uh, uh, um, I don't know, like a sanity check on some of the the, the development of uh, features and stuff like that? Because it seems like a lot of that happens just from the engineers themselves. Do you actually have a product team or people that are running product which help to sort of think about things from a user's perspective, from a trader's perspective? Because I know you said in the past that you're not like a big trader. You're not the world's best trader, you say yourself. So uh, like how much of these product development uh, initiatives that you guys do are just sourced from within the developers themselves and how much of it actually you have product people to, to do? So um, the major number of, pro of products that we deliver uh, are uh, especially the, well, of course, the, mm, we are talking about the trading oriented products are delivered by, um, let's say, a council of people that include um, me, uh, uh, the, the rest of the management and uh, um, internal and external product people. So uh, we have, um, I believe in our roadmap, uh, three uh, quite impressive products for traders that that no one has, and they are leveraging uh, both our peer-to-peer uh, -peer funding and lending market, and, um, and 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 other on on the derivative side. So uh, of course um, we are aware of the restrictions that we have. For example, on the derivative side, uh, we require full KYC while basically we are basically the only platform that does that for in full force. So um, there are some um, reasons why we have some sort of uh, bottlenecks in user acquisition. Uh, I believe that um, uh, although this has been um, uh, another topic of uh, discussion with uh, the, the broader shareholder community, uh, 
um, we believe that this is the right choice because uh, eventually, as we have been seeing in the last months, there have been increasing talks about uh, all the derivatives changes might need might needing to uh, verify everyone, and we wanted to start clean because um, as an exchange that really um, cares about regulations, we know that there is no way around. So you can try to push it as as far as you can, but the time is 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 passing and um, regulations and really even regulations are coming to town. So we decided to start uh, to start easy and light. Uh, and uh, you know, and offer a product that is already um, ready for uh, the next wave of regulations. Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I can appreciate that. And you brought up the derivative side of things, so because um, that's where I was going to pivot to next. Um, I mean, I I think it's a bit too convenient to blame the verification side of things. I think most of the big traders are actually verified, and they have access to. Uh, fiat on rails and they're active on the OTC desks. Uh, there's a reason why they're trading on the spot margin side, but not on the derivative side, I would think. And it's one thing to be lean, but I'm looking at the uh, total volume for the, your perpetual right now. The 24 hour volume is only $1.6 million. It's literally the lowest volume Bitcoin dollar uh, futures slash perpetual product that, that there is in the entire market. It's even lower than this exchange called due decks which i don't even know what that is uh and your volume's lower so it's i mean it's one thing to be lean but that's like really really low performance for what is a very high tier spot and margin exchange in phoenix because you guys dominate uh very well on that side i mean a little less as flavor said recently the market shares declined but i would expect much higher market share performance on the derivative side for an exchange of that caliber on the other side uh, I think that is a fair point, the one that you're making. Um, uh, trust me, I don't, I'm not happy about <clears throat> the volume that we're making there as well. So, um, you know, uh, there are two ways you can do that. Uh, you can pay market makers really hefty fees uh, and offer them really huge credit lines, or you can try to build it organically. Mm, it, it, it is really controversial, but we are, we are taking the second choice. And uh, from you know, I wake in the morning, I see the the, the volume, and not not happy. Then I basically th then I work my ass off to try to find a solution in a uh, in an organic way to increase the market share over time. So we are not in a rush. Um, I believe that it would be nice to start uh, you know trading one gazillion dollars in the first day. You we could trade in theory any any size, right? Um, you can pay market makers, like 20 market makers, to be within five basis points with, uh, from, from top of the market, and we can give, you can give them zero fees. Fine. You can do that, and then you have quite liquid markets. You have nice volume, but the company revenues will not change a dime. So remember, we have Leo, right? So we cannot make $1 trillion volume, and then, ex and then the, the pace of which we burn Leo remains the same. So everything has to be done organically. So unfortunately, this is really one, one wise man once said, once said uh, if you start acting um, in, a, let's say, if you start giving out uh, preferential fees or you start paying uh, market makers to create an inflate volume, you will lose your virginity and you will do it forever. So we are still in a situation where we, we are keeping our virginity together for, for ourselves. I think it's a good idea to keep your virginity and I think you can do that. Um, and I think you can boost the volume without having to, um, you know, pay for play or whatever it's called. Um, but when I'm looking at these list of 14 other exchanges, which are posting higher 24 hour volume than you, I, I really doubt that it's all because they are paying or doing backroom deals to provide, uh, especially for example, FTX, which, uh, you know, a lot of us uh, are have moved over from BitMEX recently over to FTX, and we think they're you know, generally we we feel like they have a pretty high um, uh, level of integrity, and uh, they don't even do maker rebates. They are pretty strict on the fee side of things, but they, think... they do a great job on the product side to make up for it. And I don't. And sure. I don't... Can I don't... interject I don't... here? Sorry. Two hundred and fifty million dollars on their Bitcoin perpetual and their bitcoin uh, futures so i don't think that 250 million is coming from 
uh, all the pay for play and stuff. And I think most of their volume is verified. So I think there's probably some other variables that you might want to tweak with uh, to improve. What do you think they are? So uh, definitely. So first of all, I was not referring to them. And also they are not in, uh, they making much more than us, much, much more than us agreed. And uh, they, but they are really down in the statistics as well. So that is a really interesting fact, first of all. Um, then um, I also don't, and, and I didn't say that all the volume is made that, like uh, is made like that, right? But you can build your volume. You can show a really tight and really full restaurant for a few months in that way, and then people will come. So we decided to not do that. That's that's simple as that, right? So for, of course, if you sum all the different things like full KYC and then um the fact that uh we our kyc is really really thorough the fact that we don't have we don't, are not market making our own books the fact that we don't pay market makers and all these things together they sum up definitely and also you can add i'm, I'm putting myself in this you can add the fact that um you know uh you we might not have executed it well i comp i i think that we should have uh, executed it better we might have done it we are trying to improve in that way um so i'm not blaming blaming the rest of the world i'm saying this is why it takes a lot of time to build an organic volume in the way we are doing we might have chosen different paths um and uh, we might have cut some corners we decided not uh, and we might, we should have executed better from day one, which is what is we are trying to do it now. We have a better and long-term strategy. Um, yeah, uh, it's a sum of things um, that uh, definitely uh, some of uh, a sum of issues. Swapman, you you were just saying how and you know it's not all to do with this. Uh, you consider yourself a financial engineering guru. You know, why don't you drop some of these knowledge bombs on uh, what you think they could do to make it, you know, to bring li more liquidity and volume? I think that's outside the scope of this. I'm not going to just like uh, start advising on things like that. But uh, why don't we shift to a different topic then? Um, because I think we've discussed enough about the derivatives. Um, you have this feature on the spot side where you consolidate liquidity across books for like usd and euro um i'm curious just in general why don't you add tether to this so that the tether books um consolidate with the usd and euro and other books uh that is a good idea um i think that uh, it could be done um but the, the reason why we didn't do in first place was that um when we uh when bitfinex um in 2009 uh, sorry 2018 and 2018 decided to um split uh or uh, to remove the pack from one 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 to one with uh, between one dollar and one usdt then there was only one other exchange that was offering uh a market for usd usdt so we added ours, but it took a long, long time in order to gain uh, enough liquidity. And also, the liqu I wouldn't, wouldn't say that liquidity between uh, USD and USDT is, is superb on um, across anyway the, uh, all the exchanges right now. So um, I think that that is is one of the reasons. So the idea, so with um, with FX, with uh, let's say FX markets you can sort of um, you know, adjust the effects and rebalance the internal effects every one minute. But with Tether, you would need it to do, to do it more frequently because the liquidity that is on the uh, USD, USDT pair is much lower. So there is higher risk of, risk of manipulation and so on. So it has been a tricky one. I thought about it for a while and uh, you know, it didn't feel me, uh, to me really urgent. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's fair enough. It's just sometimes strange to look at the books of some assets where you look at the USD book, it's nice and thick, and then you look at the USDT, and it's quite different, and it just seems natural to consolidate. Uh, but um, so you recently had delisted certain pairs, and Flipper and I were looking through the sort of tickers that you're having now, and it's one of the bigger changes that Phoenix has made like over the long term for the past five years, basically. Um, that Phoenix went from an exchange where Phil famously said, uh, you know, I can't believe I listed this shitcoin when he was referring to ETH. 
uh, Ethereum. And uh, now you guys basically list like fucking shit coins I've never even heard of. I don't even understand why they're being listed and the liquidity is so low on some of them. It's sort of like a mystery what the reason is to keep them going because you can't possibly be making that much money when the volume is so low. So um, do you guys take a systematic approach to which tokens and pairs get listed and when you consider them for delisting? Uh, what sort of principles go into this? So uh, first of all, I want to um, make a point on why we have so many tokens. And first of all, I believe that you cannot really, I mean, um, I think that the listing Ethereum was uh, the good, uh, right choice, right? So um, all the exchanges that listed Ethereum made, made a, a, a lot of revenues and so had to be listed. And, um, and as, as well as many other projects were right to be listed. Also, uh, Bitfinex, um, if you recall, at some point had Atfinex. So we, we basically listed all the projects that Atfinex with the, with the open community listing process decided to list. So right now we have, um, we have inherited that list of products and then um, we are taking now steps to understand uh, which, which pairs we can remove in order to consolidate liquidity and uh, I think that over the last uh, two months, we removed more or less 150 pairs. So are you, I mean, what, what's the system that you're using to filter down and make this choice? Are you just strictly looking at how much order depth there is in the books and how much volume is being generated or what's the, what's the So as you know, I mean, yes, definitely an exchange makes money on volume and generated fees, right? But um, well, the thing that I care most is um, is liquidity. So there are many of the the, the tokens that the, sorry the pairs that we delisted that had really wide spreads between bid and ask, right? So when an exchange come to Bitfinex, we never ask things like you please create volume or things like that. That is completely we we have a really strict rule book um, that will be made publicly in the next couple of weeks about all the um, the. The, the different rules uh, of engaging Bitfinex. But what we uh, gently ask is to ensure that there is good liquidity on the bid and ask side uh, with a re uh, reasonable spread. If there is not enough liquidity uh, or if the spread is, is uh, too wide and there is no way that uh, the community is interested to in, uh, in reducing the spreads and uh, that lasts for quite some time, we decide to list the, to the, list the pair. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, and I think publishing that rule book would be pretty cool and maybe a good guide for other exchanges that are less principled on that front. Um, what about the technical in de the technical debt incurred of just maintaining so much coins that are doing zero volume? So, you know, when it comes to nearest 20, basically the, the cost is almost zero. Um, of course, um, the what is happening recently is that a uh, few exchanges uh, sorry few tokens started to go to mainnet and that is the tricky part right so um if there is no volume if there is no community and there is high risk that um in the possible flows in their main mainnet code there that is where we become really cautious in what we continue to support for the mainnet uh, for the mainnet swap so we want to ensure that um, when we support mainnet swap, that token is uh, is uh, is has a really good community, has a lot of followers on Twitter, has a lot of comments. It's easy to read the code, even for us. It's easy to build the code and so on. Right? The dependencies are all um, and uh, are you can build your static version with your with your own libraries and so on. So. That is really what we care uh, moving forward, and we are taking steps in, in ensuring that if we have to support a mainnet uh, swap, that uh, is on. If we support a mainnet swap, is only because that token is, is really safe. Otherwise, we we might take the decision to delist it. Yeah, I think that that makes sense because that's where it gets really annoying that you have to handle all of the uh, engineering side of running. Mm, I think. I think Binance does actually have some listed guidelines as well, which you know says if if your token does not meet these standards, we will remove it. I know there was some talk about that for a while on Finex, but yeah. So um, let's talk about fiat on and off ramp for Finex. Um, so 
in the past we've seen that the Bitfinex price for uh, the top crypto assets can deviate sometimes uh, from the rest of the market, often in, in a premium because it's difficult to pull out fiat. So people will just bid up the crypto prices and pull them out. Um, how much are you guys worried about this as a, an issue? I, I've noticed in the market it's not as much of an issue recently, but um, you know, are you guys working to get more and more fiat uh, ramps going, more rails, so that people can more easily arbitrage these spreads uh, and not face all the frictions that currently are, are a lot of people have to deal with? Well, I'm not sure about currently. Uh, what we have been hearing is a, a lot of um, uh, good feedback about our current banking. So, um, if uh, if there are uh, if there are people um, st still concerned, I'm happy to address uh, their concerns. But uh, the current banking system that we have works really smoothly. There is, of course, the, the limitation of ten thousand uh, dollars deposit and withdrawal because. Uh, we want to ensure that we can keep um, a slick operation and not get uh, polluted by uh, smaller um, by, by smaller wires. That is, I understand, is controversial. But with uh, bigger sizes than 10k, then uh, I believe that our banking re runs really smoothly uh, since uh, several months. I would say. Yeah. No. I'm sorry. Go ahead. I can say I remember a long time ago when you're banking in Taiwan and there was that issue with Americans uh, applying pressure on Taiwan uh, or something like this and you know it ended up having to be transferred to the lawyer's account or whatever like this and I remember that all the money was kind of in this Taiwanese bank so it's kind of centralized if you like and I think the idea after was that you know if you have a, a billion dollars you should put 200 mil in all these different accounts. So if something goes wrong, I don't know, like crypto capital, for example, you know, you're not at a centralized point of failure. So what's the current Finex banking situation like? Is it distributed? Are there, is there one bank? Is there a hundred banks? Is I believe that is a middle ground, right? So we, we, we don't have 100 banks, but we have, uh, we are getting um, increasing support with, from different uh, institutions in order to, um, to, to open bank accounts. I believe that uh, um, going back to, um, uh, I think that all the work that the legal team uh, and the mm, marketing team and the public relations team made helped us really a lot in to convey our message and to help us to reassure institutions that, uh, that we are the good guys there. And uh, and uh, we are uh, trusted with uh, um, uh, by by institutions, and uh, I think that that's why I say that the current uh, banking situation, uh, uh, from what I can see and from from my understanding, I mean I'm, I'm on the tech side, you know, but still from what I can see and from the feedback that I get, uh, feels really good. Yeah, I, I, it's great that institutions are trusting you. So, uh, so how many banks are you, are you have you got the money stashed in at the moment? Six. Okay, well, six is better than one. <laughs> All right, so you mentioned earlier ETH Phoenix, um, and now they are sort of rebranding, and maybe maybe some of the resources were misallocated towards that. And you've also got EOS Phoenix, which you're still keeping alive. Is this thing, like, what is the motivation to keep EOS Phoenix running? Uh, like, what really is, I mean, it just seems surprising that you guys have spend so much resources uh, on this uh, what exactly is going on behind the scenes there well uh, the the so much resources is really um uh, subjective right um there are two people that are working on usfinex they are great developers and they are experimenting with the technology uh and still so we are um so the experience that we got is really important to me because we are trying to create a sort of um cloud of non-custodial uh, solutions for Bitfinex. And, you know, Diversify is working on that for Ethereum and EOSFinex is working on that uh, for EOS and so on, right? We are working on that uh, internally and I'm personally working on that for Lightning Network. Um, so there are so many, uh, so for me, it's important to test and play with the technology. Um, 
technology that can be controversial, that can be uh, called in different names by different people. You know, I'm not really big fan of religion wars. I'm a really big believer in Bitcoin, but still, I when I, I see the code, I like playing with it. So that is the reason behind it. Uh, we are not investing crazy amounts of, of money in it. We are supporting a project that we promise to deliver and also open us the mind to understand how to design better certain parts of Bitfinex in order to be able to um, offer non-custodial solutions in a more generic agnostic way to different blockchains. Yeah, I mean, that's okay, that's fair enough, right? That you're spending resources to play around in some of these other areas and can learn lessons which are applied to other parts of the business. I mean, that's fair. Um, and at least you're having three developers on Lightning and only two on EOS. Uh, but I still think the ratio would be better if the uh, resources for developers on the Bitcoin side was way higher than all the shit coins combined because EOS is in fact a shit coin. Uh, but why exactly did you, uh, or why did ETHFINEX rebrand to diversify? What was the, what's going on there? Why aren't they still ETHFINEX? So I think that the um, um, ETHFINEX team wanted to test uh, a different strategy. Um, and trying to uh, go in a, let's say, more um, agnostic direction as well, right? So uh, Bitfinex own, uh, um, uh, of course, shares in, uh, in, that, um, uh, in that enterprise. And um, um, I, I believe that the technology that has been developed by Equinex and then um, improved uh, vastly by Diversify can help to build... Um, um, an exchange that really not acquires liquidity only from Bitfinex, but also from other sources, for example, still maintaining the non-custodial um, aspect of it. So I think that uh, it was um, um, from, you know, was a, a really uh, friendly departure. Uh, I think that uh, from, uh, for Bitfinex shareholders makes sense uh, also because um, it gives some sort of hedge in, uh, in creating a separate product uh, with a separate team and so on. So um, we, we thought that was, was, uh, was fair. Mm, sentiment. Because there is a sentiment section on the site as well. And we were looking at this earlier and saying, who's looking at this? And I think this goes all the way back to what we were talking before, uh, resource allocation and innovation. And, you know, uh, if you say... Where does the where do because without profit, you know, nobody has has a job, right? You have to work in McDonald's. So where does the money come from? It comes from trading fees. So it's like you need to pour, you know, your time into building this revenue stream, and you see stuff from FTX like their move contracts, uh, dairy bit with the options. Uh, FTX just put the um, uh, the oil contracts on as well, and you know at Finex here we've got EOS Finex, ETH Finex, Santiment, Pulse, Bit Refill, uh, you know, and, and these things are not contributing to you know the core revenue driver. So. For example, for the options, we, we have been working on it and we are um, really uh, going to deliver a product. But honestly, you, you cannot deliver a product. We, we, cannot, we first need to improve on the future side and become better there before delivering the options. So I believe that uh, I, I take your point. Um, I, I have a different view. I believe that Bitfinex is set to become in long run a more complete platform. Um, we want to, we are adding uh, under the hood many, many features for products that you don't even know about, right? So uh, you, I understand that from your point of view, you, you, you see um, things that you don't relate to your trading experience, but that is, um, that is a part of a longer vision about what Bitfinex should be. So you can say the same thing about Lightning Network, right? But you didn't mention it in, in, uh, in before. The, uh, Lightning Network is not generating revenues, but is supporting a technology, is supporting a community that will eventually will drive traffic and will drive volume to Bitfinex. So, I mean, I understand your point. I, I think that the vision around Bitfinex is, for long term, is to become um, a sort of backbone for many, many technologies to hook into their APIs and look into and hook into their its infrastructure.
Yeah, it, it take for example, like we spoke for a long time about how the order book is well down below at the bottom of the page and you can't kind of like bring it up to where you're doing it. We spoke about the volume bars out of sync. I saw a guy just tweeting uh, when you tweeted about Pulse or something. He tweeted and said, hey, this thing's out of sync. You know, these are the things, you know, which are directly correlated and related to the primary revenue generation on Finex as a site, and they have not been done, and they have been put on the back burner and neglected while effort has been focused on Pulse. Now, I don't know where the market demand is coming for for Pulse, because when I speak to people every day, they say to me, I wanna trade oil with my Bitcoin because Bitcoin's dead right now. That's the demand from the customers for what they want. I don't see anybody ever saying to me, God, I really wish there was this stunted, muted version of Twitter on the Finex site. Sure. Um, again, um, that, is, uh, that is your point and is, I believe is limited to your at this point in time. Because if oil was, didn't suffer the 12 and 13 of March, it, you wouldn't say the same thing. But you can definitely say the same thing for many different in diff, many different aspects, right? So, I mean, I, I I guess I get what you're saying. I believe that again, this is part of a longer vision of around Bitfinex. Also, we have been working for months to deliver um, products uh, related to commodities, but in a you know in a safe way. Um, and when I say safe, it means that we need to have all the instruments and the ability to to uh, to you know, even get tick by tick, uh, tick data from um, the um, from traditional exchanges, um, I think that the, the the way we are designing our products is more uh, cautious of uh, of um, regulations in general and really attentive to to not um, poke the bear, bear there. And it's really important also uh, for shareholders, right? Because you you really want to ensure that. Uh, there are there are not any more issues whatsoever, and Bitfinex can run a, a, a slick operation and only focus on technology and growth. Right, everything else is a distraction. So what we are doing now is to to focus on trying to find the best way and talk to regulators and talk to um, external councils on all around the world to ensure that we can build a product. Then we the the next wave of regulation will shut it down. I get that is uh, that is cool to have it in the short term because um, you know um, you want to trade it fine, but this unfortunately this is not the way Bitfinex can move in this moment. Uh, I think that we have to pick our battles and to um, also uh, we and also ensure that um, we can follow uh, properly um, regulations um, and uh, and. Uh, um, you know, if we use, if, if we design a product, it has to be um, uh, made in the, in the best way possible. I don't like to have... Yeah. Uh, it's very good that you're talking about, you know, doing things the right way and making sure you don't run into legal trouble. That's fantastic. But that's not to do with, um, you know, kind of continuing to innovate or or kind of improve the existing trading stuff which you know btc usd trading volume is probably like 70 percent and eth usd probably like 70 80 90 percent of all revenue and aspects in that regard have been left on the back burner and put aside for bit refill and pulse which which only incurs technical debt and overhead and provides you know little to no increase in revenue well, you know, um, that is your opinion. I believe that uh, that is um, a narrow view of what Bitfinex should be. So we have a different idea. So I respect your 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 idea there. Uh, but is uh, uh, I mean, unfortunately, uh, <laughs> the main guy that designed products is me. So you can blame them, blame me and not the company to take these decisions. Um, I believe that uh, behind the scenes we are making really crazy improvements for for future products. Uh, of course, uh, it takes a lot of time when also, on, as, as said, on legal side and the regulatory side to ensure that we can list them and not have any more problems. So I respect what you're saying. I, con I, I disagree with what you're saying, but because you are not, you don't have the full picture, uh, 
fine. Okay, uh, so uh, uh, to add to a different uh, and a different angle to this, so what, like basically when I look at Phoenix, I see an exchange run by uh, developers, engineers, and lawyers because you're you're further on the risk averse side of the spectrum uh, than an exchange like FTX, for example. Um, and you said yourself that you're designing the products, but then you've also said that you don't you don't trade, you're not good at trading. And I think the problem is that other exchanges tend to have more like product people. So like people with experience trading, people with more experience, like actually using these products and uh, being able to respond more uh, uh, directly and dynamically to the needs of traders. And I think that's like one gap uh, maybe in Bitfinex that you're, there's great uh, tech. You guys are great at developing and engineering these things. Um, but then it's just sort of like you guys spinning up all these uh, different little side projects and then, you know, legal is driving too much of the product stuff. Like the legal side is too much like, oh, you can't do this, you can't do that. Whereas if you look at other shops, I know we've been saying FTX too many times, but they're a good example because they all still release the product, but it will be limited significantly in the jurisdictions. So sometimes you will release like oil or prediction market contract and it'll say, you know, no US, Europe. UK, China, and it's like, you know, what countries are left. Uh, but it's still that they're innovating within that constraint of the legal. And uh, and I think that's sort of the theme of what a lot of what we discussed uh, the past couple hours is that, you know, developers are developing, but developers aren't and engineers aren't necessarily the best when it comes to product design and UX. And that's uh -huh. that can be value added. So mm, don't get me wrong. I'm not the person that uh, decides everything and design all the products. So I'm not good at trading. That doesn't mean that I have a, a long-standing trading experience. So, and I don't like trading. So, um, but at the same time, I respect more the opinion of, uh, uh, there is an external council, an internal council of people that have much more experience and direct experience than me in trading. Uh, and they help in designing and suggesting the products. But I believe that although I really have a huge respect for, for FTX, uh, I'm, uh, my, uh, my only worry is about regulations. And, you know, Bitfinex is in a situation where we have already a lot of battles and we want to ensure that um, for, uh, for everyone, for our users and community, we don't, uh, we don't fall in other traps of uh, creating products that are... Um, super easy to create because i mean we would have we could have listed the um, oil contract months ago uh because it was already in the pipeline before the, the, the before march right but you know we 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 took our time to ensure that we could do it safely um i understand that uh, you you feel like bitfinex is is driven by lawyers is not like that i believe that uh, if a company has a really long vision it has to have uh, a good when you design a product you have to ensure that it's long lasting otherwise you will waste your development anyway so designing a product and launching we could have launched more we can have launched many many of these products um we are we were we are discussing since months about a fixed product but you know we want we are more careful and we are uh we are ensuring that we are not going to um shoot in our feet when it comes to regulations. Uh, that is the last thing that we need in this moment. And that is also the only way to ensure that uh, Bitfinex and any crypto exchange will have a long life. I understand that from, um, let's say, a trading and user perspective, you want everything now and, and fast. But um, from the Bitfinex and the company point of view, you think that you want to create really good products and you want to complete a vision that will might last three, five, 10 years. So. If you keep creating, uh, you, you can. Um, my, our feeling is that you cannot, um, you you cannot basically uh, publish something and then ask for for forgiveness. You have to be preemptive now. It's not anymore 2017. So that is that is the way we run the company. Uh, I understand that my seem that we are like um, elephants. Uh, I, I really, but uh, from uh, an external point of view, I really believe that internally we are moving as fast as a, a really um, innovative company can move. Um, and uh, I think that uh, what we did in the last uh, six, uh, eight to eight months, 
has been impressive in terms of company uh, in, um, in uh, all the team's improvement and the, uh, the, the technology improvement and the ability of uh, launching um, of, uh, of launching new markets uh, every day. Um, as said, uh, it's important for us to ensure that the company is protected for the long run. Pana, you just said that, you know, uh, before you said this, you said, you know, I, I'm in charge of designing the products. And you know, we were talking yesterday, and uh, as Swatman said in a very kind of weak, limpish way, is that, uh, you know, the, the product design is by uh, uh, engineers and coders, uh, and I know it's FTX, but you know Sam, he's he's trading a lot. So you know, it, is it is it like uh, you know a lack of uh, you know direction on this? You know, what are these products? And he said, oh, we don't know the vision. And you know, I thought Phoenix was a trading platform primarily. You know, that's where the money comes from for it. But this this weird pivoting. You know, what is the direction clear? Uh, well, um, the direction is clear to us. Uh, also, um, uh, I appreciate that. I mean, I really like Sam. I really like FTX. Um, I, I just think that uh, you know, I'm I'm the guy that uh, that basically approves the projects, and there is no project that I say no, right? So we have a good uh, council of uh, of traders that are helping us, and they are super knowledgeable in building trading products, much more than me. So. The, the key is we, we, we come up with an idea, we run by uh, legal and regulators, and we try to put in, in place. And if we get beaten, if someone does it first, it's fine, because again, we work in the long term. So if we decide to list an oil contract, it will be because we have a direct connection with, to, to a top tier uh, traditional exchange, we can get tick by tick data and so on. So, uh, I mean, there are different ways you can design a product. There is the easy way, there is the most complex way. We believe that uh, the way um, we are working is, is uh, of course, more complex and more, but I believe more future-proof. So I'm not the guy that decides uh, everything and every single detail of the products. I'm the guy that uh, basically uh, then have to implement the products and needs to give a sort of a priority and a sense. And my, our priorities is to launch uh, new financial products uh, as soon as we can. But there are, there are many in the pipeline, but they have to respect the rules. And the rules are not only, uh, the rules are not only set by me, but a group uh, of people that involve uh, compliance, uh, legal, and so on. So in the long run, it will pay. In the short, uh, short term, I can understand why it was, we, you feel that we are going slow. Okay, so head of priorities, and we're prioritizing pulse, bit refill over some of these other things. Okay, fine. But the other thing was these Phoenix shares. Not only have the Phoenix shareholders been shafted from Leo, not only have they been shafted with no dividends, but they've also been shafted in that there's no way for them to be tradable. Now, when the Tether FUD comes out, you know, that's an opportunity for weak hands to jump out and strong hands to, you know, acquire more positions. And this has been a long time going, you know, still nothing. Sure. Um, we have been proposing to the shareholder group a solution to that, and they are evaluating it. So I believe that we have a good way to handle it. Um, mm -hmm. And, and um, it can be, so um, stay tuned. I mean, a lot of talk, you know, you know, you've been saying stay tuned for about two years, three years now, you know, maybe even four years. Yeah, you know, a lot of staying tuned. People have been staying tuned for a long time. You know, need to see something delivered beyond bit refill and pulse. Man, you really hate bit refill. <laughs> <laughs> I think that I think the sentiment uh, which Flipper like is representing a bit too extreme is that um, People think that the maybe Bitfinex is becoming too risk averse, uh, and maybe it's with good reason because of the legal issues that have popped up, and there are some frivolous lawsuits that are out there, which you probably can't talk about anyway, so we won't bother with that. Um, but I think that there's always a spectrum when it comes to legal, and, and all exchanges out there in crypto have the same issues. They're facing the same trade-offs where they have to wonder, do we you know, pump out that innovation fast, take the risk? 
uh, and uh, you know pay a fine later or something or whatever the trade off is. And I think that a lot of people feel that too much considerations given to legal compliance, running things at Phoenix, um, and maybe on the product side that developers are maybe driving things too much when they don't have the um, expertise necessarily to do it properly. Um, but let's move on from that. Uh, how about a test version of the website where people can actually, uh, you know, I mean, many exchanges have test nets where you can just test out API implementations or just get your feed wet demo in it. Uh, what is the plan if there is any to to launch this, which is kind of a basic thing to have for most exchanges? So um, at the end of May, we will issue on the main platform. So what I don't like is to offer a separate platform um, for, for this. I want people to feel the production performance. So what we will be offering is uh, the, a way to convert a sub account into paper trading, like you know, with interactive brokers. So you will be having, you will have test BTC and test USD that can be uh, credited to your to that specific sub account, um, and you can. Um, there will be active markets that will try to replicate as much as possible the the let's say underlying market. And um, uh, so that is in our roadmap within let's say. 45 days, something like that. Yeah, I mean, because that's uh, an easy way for people who are scared to trade uh, because it's overwhelming. They want to do a demo and also for people just wanting to test the API implementation. So, um, so, I, yeah, go ahead. so I saw the question why I don't like a separate exchange because um, it will, in, so first of all, the, the, um, the you want to understand what will be the latency on um, on the primary exchange anyway. Our matching engine is designed so it, it is um, is sharded, so you can handle pairs uh, in um, in uh, the test pairs in a different shard, so you will not affect the performance of the, the all the other trading um, uh, trading pairs. So uh, at the same time, we can manage only one platform. So all the updates that you would do on the on the main platform, you would need to do them on the paper trading platform. So we decided to go with, uh, uh, I would say, a, in my opinion, a cooler solution where you have only one platform. You can hook into the same um, in the same API endpoints and so on. You just trade different products with a uh, different set of API keys because are uh, belong to a separate uh, sub account. So. Uh, also, it will be available for margin and for for we are, will have also derivative test derivative pairs. That's good. Yeah, and um, so have anyone at the Bitfinex even used the mobile app? Like, do you know how annoying it is to have these pop ups all the time? People have to install ad blockers just to prevent all the ridiculous affiliate pop up, bit refill pop up. When you're using the mobile app that's extremely annoying for a lot of people here that they've mentioned uh, when we said you were going to come on so they want to know what the hell is wrong with the mobile app and the pop-ups well i mean um we try to use it for distributing um uh, content my understanding and then we i can double check with uh, with mobile app team is that if you close it once if we only show once per type the, the pop-up. If that not is not is the case, I will take it as a bug and I will report it. Yeah, I mean, I think that it makes a lot more sense on desktop where it's not as much of an annoyance, but with mobile, it's like, you know, it's really annoying. And uh, the other things that people, just to wrap this up, like uh, people were saying about bugs that need to be fixed. There are certain like volume numbers that aren't reporting properly. Uh, no four hour time frame on the charts. Like that's pretty easy to implement, right? Uh, yeah, that has been um, for um, the joy of uh, Fliber has been a black back burner the four hours uh, for um, time frame for quite a while, uh, but uh, is in our schedule for uh, the next upgrade that will be likely. We wanted to do it before uh, the halving. It will be come freely. Uh, it will happen likely after the halving. You know, uh, if the market will not go ape shit. Yeah, um, and then. Making the UI more customizable, dragging the elements around a lot of exchange. exchange. Uh, are you? I don't know if you're using React, but Sam from Bitmax he made this draggable React library, which is really cool. That lets you easily move the components around and make your own uh, UI user specific. 
So although, again, it seems like we are not doing it and um, I, I was blamed in putting that in the back burner, you have to understand the history of Bitfinex, right? Bitfinex started as a full Ruby on Rails application that had hundreds of different components all written in uh, that static way. So it's not you can start an easy and nice exchange from scratch. You have to, you have to move step by step. And probably in the next month or so, we will publish the demo of uh, the new uh, single page application um, that we built that is super slick. It loads like in a, in a snap. Um, and uh, the entire UI team really gave a huge priority in creating all these mo modular React as components so they can be um, instantiated many times for you, maybe you can have want to have an aggregated uh, uh, view for with multiple books and things like that. So it, it, we have now a really proper framework that is um, uh, it, it's really designed for speed and performance. Um, and uh, it took basically two years to completely to move uh, to shift from what we had to what uh, to to this new framework and the next step will be basically ditching the entire um the the underlying um rails server and then serving just this as um the um, the single page application and then we are re we are really really close in, uh, to that uh, and we basically that is uh, on the on the front end team that is the number one priority good that sounds good. Okay, so uh, yeah, we've gone at this now for over an hour and a half, and you're obviously very busy, so we'll cut it here. I don't think anyone else had any additional questions. Uh, so thanks very much for putting up with Flipper's harassment. He bullied you to get on here. Wow, what a pussy. Oh my god, you pussied out big time. He was extremely rude while you were on here, but you, you stood up to it very well. Thank you for your courage and your openness and transparency. Thank you very much for coming on, Paolo. Thanks, Paolo. Thanks, Paolo. No worries. I will I will kick a, a fever in the ass the next time I will see him. Don't no worries. <laughs> yeah, that was solid. I mean you you stood up to like almost two hours of uh, of fire, which is uh, great stuff. You know, that's my life. So I I I wake up in the morning and start start fighting, so <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, guys, for having me. Have a good rest of the day, uh, evening, night. Uh, thank you very much for listening to me, uh, listen to my uh, rambling. Much appreciated. I actually appreciate when you are supporting Lightning and Bitcoin development. Please keep doing that. Oh, we have pretty uh, an, a nice list of things on that side. So we are working with a few hedge funds that are really interested in um, in uh, settling trades. Uh, uh, using Lightning Network and when available using RGB. So that is really, that will make my day because then you have basically a full Lightning Network based um, decentralized settlement system. And if other exchanges will adopt it, it will become mind blowing. And I'm, I'm really happy to lead the way. Of course, first we have to add the washing machine and, um, um, you know, um, and a few other. Uh, unusable things to beat finesse for the joy of flavor, but that is really our number one priority, if, even if from the outside you don't see it. <laughs> yeah, well, we hope to see all of these seeds that you're planting uh, make to grow some good flowers and, and stuff. Thank you again. Bye, guys. Take care. Thanks.